also, uh, I'm teaching a class of Bard this year called Strange Books. And I decided to just pick the 15 strangest books I could think of. Uh, and partly as my own kind of personal protest against the professionalization of literature, because, because as some of you I'm sure know, there's a kind of uh, attitude, um, particularly among students, which seems to me especially unfortunate, which is, it's as if literature were, you know, any other profession like orthodontia or, you know, whatever, <laughs> that, um, that it's, you know, you go to the right MFA program, you get the right teachers, you get published in the right journals, you find the right agent, and then you're just on your way, the way, you know, as if you were on the Hartford Law Review. Well, it's really not like that. So I decided to um, just pick 15 writers who either were institutionalized or should have been. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so for, I mean, and it's quite a, a, a wide-ranging and, and strange list. So, you know, Hans Christian Andersen, Lewis Carroll, Bruno Schultz, Jane Bowles, you know, writers who are really, really out there. And, and one of the things that I find most moving about the books and the writers and, and my discussions with my amazing students is that, is that I feel that we're not only in connection with the consciousness of these writers, but with the unconscious of these writers, because these particular writers really had had less control on how much of their uh, uh, over how much of their unconscious they just spilled into the page. So, for example, we were reading um, uh, Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Snow Queen, which some of you may know, which is which is you know Andersen s seems to have thought that he was writing this this kind of darling, improving parable about children. Uh, going through various travails and difficulties and winding up singing in the sunshine and, and you know, singing Christian hymns. Well, in fact, it's one of the most dark, disturbing, erotic, uh, awful, in some ways, stories ever written. So, and, and it was purely Anderson's unconscious that created the story and not his conscious mind, which thought it was doing something else. So, so week after week, I feel that, that you know, all these writers who, and I, and I ask my students to write kind of we're doing kind of group biographies of the writers, so each one brings in an anecdote about the writer, and we create a kind of biography. So, so Gogol, um, uh, Bolaño, uh, Henry Green, I mean, just strange, strange books. So, so here are these writers, most of whom Kleist, <coughs> most of whom led terrible lives, really terrible lives, or painful lives, or, or you know, and here, 200 years later, these bright, fresh-faced, bard kids are reading these books, and, and we are, you know, reading. And we're, I feel, in intimate connection with these people who no longer lived. And, and if only they knew that they were being written, re read in this way by these students, um, and they continue to live. The other, another reason for reading is, um, is for a kind of community. I mean, not only a community of writers and readers, but a community based on fictional characters. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, my husband was reading David Copperfield, and, and he read me so much of the book aloud that I thought I might as well read it, because I've already heard half of it. So I read David Copperfield, and it was as if we had all these new friends <laughs> who were characters of David Copperfield. We knew them so well, and we knew so much about them, and we were so interested in their lives and what happened to them and um, and their interconnections. I mean, likewise, one of the reasons for reading Proust is because you get a whole new world. I mean, you're going to, to parties at the Verdurins and the Duchesse de Gaumont and and the interconnections. I mean, if, you, if you're reading Proust and you try to tell someone about the passage you're reading, it's so connected with so many other passages. So so. Reading gives you a whole other world, a world that someone has created, a world that someone may have experienced or not. But it's suddenly, during the time that you're reading it, it becomes your world as well. And, and I can't think of anything else, really, that does that for you. And, and also, you know, reading Remembrance of Things Past, it takes, even for a fast reader, like four months. No one would be willing to sit through a movie that lasted four months. It just can't, you know, it just doesn't happen. But there you are in this other world in addition to your own for, for all that time. 
Um, I left out pleasure. I realized, <laughs> or maybe I did, but but that seems to me finally <coughs> the thing that that you keep coming back to. Why we read? I mean, there's something about beginning a book and reading the first few pages and and liking them and enjoying them. I mean, I should say, let me go on record as saying, I love the new Jonathan Franzen novel. I mean, I realize there's a lot of controversy. I just adored it. I mean, and for me, it combined all these different things I've been talking about. Um, I was. I read it the summer. I was on a airplane, long airplane flight. I was staying somewhere where there was no air conditioning. It was 95 degrees. No one slept. And another airplane flight. I read the Jonathan Franzen novel the whole time there back during the long hot nights. Uh, and I was taken away from where I was. I was given information about these characters' lives. I was involved in the lives of these characters. I felt I had this other community, uh, not the most pleasant community, but nonetheless uh, there I was. <laughs> So, uh, so, and it was just pure joy. I was happy as long as I was reading the book. So pleasure, finally, is, is to me the most, you know, one of the, one of the most certain, or if not the most, reasons for reading. And finally, um, for, for change, for, for to change yourself. I saw, some of you may have seen this, but um, there was an essay in the New York Times Book Review that I really quite loved called The Plot Escapes Me. Uh, Mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago, and, and it was written by a guy who seemed to be hot, having a problem that I've been having, which is the inability to remember anything. <laughs> so, and he would, you know, you read a book, and, and I've been complaining about the same thing, and he said, why am I bothering to read anything when I can't remember it two weeks later? Uh, which was a question I'd certainly been asking myself. So, um, so he talks about it at some length, and then I'll just read you a part of it. Um, which I found immensely comforting. Uh, I called Marianne Wolf, a professor of child development at Tufts University and the author of, quote, Proust in the Squid, the Story and Science of the Reading Brain. I described my perjury problem. He was, he was reading a book about the uh, Alger Hiss, Whitaker Chambers case. I was interested in the subject and engrossed in the book for days, but now remembered nothing about it and asked her if reading it had ultimately had any effect on me. I totally believe that you are a different person for having read that book, Wolf replied. I say that as a neuroscientist and an old literature major. She went on to describe how reading creates pathways in the brain, strengthening different mental processes. Then she talked about content. There's a difference, she said, between immediate recall of facts and the ability to recall a gestalt of knowledge. We can't retrieve the specifics, but you have the phrase of William James's, there is a wraith of memory. The information you get from a book is stored in networks. We have an extraordinary capacity for storage, and much more is there than you realize. It is in some way working on you, even though you aren't thinking about it. Did this mean that it hadn't been a waste of time to read all those books, even if I seemingly couldn't remember what, what was in them? It's there, Wolf said. You were the sum of it all. This was very encouraging, and it makes intuitive sense. We have been formed by an accretion of experiences, only a small number of which we can readily recall. You may remember the specifics of only a few conversations with your best friend, but you would never ask if talking to him or her was a waste of time. As for the arts, I can remember in detail only a tiny fraction of the music I've listened to, or the movies I've watched, or the paintings I've looked at, but it would be absurd to claim that experiencing those works had no influence on me. The same could be said of reading. Thank you. Talk a little bit about your your process of writing, how you go about it during the kind of time of day, structure, all the alone. Your room, <laughs> My process you know, just, yeah. Well, you know, I wish I knew. Mm. I mean, because it's mm. different from book to book, and um, and it's always changing. And just as soon as I think I know what I'm doing, I find out that that doesn't work anymore for something I'm doing now. 